And that's why it's important in life to like to seek out new perspectives at all times. You know what I mean? I, I think that's um, that's a great function of this podcast and what you do. You know, uh, I think that's uh, you know if you if you just stay in your you know your little I guess bubble might be the word that we use these days. Sure. And like you don't challenge yourself and expose yourself to other ideas. Um, you know, you're not going to experience any growth and you're not likely to achieve any wisdom. So, you know, I, 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 I think it's, it's wise to seek other perspectives and do so in as many ways as possible. Hello, and welcome back to the Vinny Brusco show podcast. I hope you've been enjoying the show so far. And if you have been Show some support, show some love, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Spread the word, tell a friend, of course, but also please click the subscribe button down low, type a little message, leave a little comment, whatever you got, it would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Enjoy. Hey, I'm Dr. Williams, and you're checking out the Vinny Brusco Show. And here we go. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks for coming. I'm happy to be here. This is, uh, I'm excited to try this. I've been dying to. Uh... Yeah, so this is uh, athletic brewing uh, non-alcoholic beer. Are you a non-alcoholic beer drinker? I've, I've recently converted. Actually, last year I went through a period where that's all I was drinking for a couple months. And yeah. I, in winter, I, you know, went back drinking some alcohol, but now I'm, I'm back on this and it makes a world of difference, man. Does it? Yeah, I mean. For me, it's, I mean, it's the quality of my sleep, honestly. You know, I, even after one or two beers, I, I just noticed like the next day, like, you know, I'm not hungover, but you don't sleep the same when, you, when you've had an alcoholic beverage. Right, right, you know? right. You can lean in a little bit more into that. So there you could. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. don't want to lose you. Yeah. You notice that or? Uh, I'm not a big drinker. Oh, okay. I'm not a big drinker. I'll have like one with dinner. And maybe that's like the offset there is that it's like substantially with food. You know what I mean? There's something kind of absorbing it as I'm going along. Yeah. But I, I also don't have a job like <laughs> yours. You know what I mean? I don't have that that type of job where it's like, oh, I need to be like on the same way that you need to be on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Your reference. I'm an emergency medicine doctor. Yeah. I, I work at, uh, I could say the name. I work at Weiler Hospital in the Bronx. I tell everybody that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's an exciting job. And yeah, I, you know need to be fresh and, and ready to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I'm there in the morning. Yeah, one or two beers can, like, be the difference. Yeah, man, I see you wearing, um, what do you got, a whoop there? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I do a Fitbit. Um, and uh, you, would, you, would, you would tell if you actually looked at it. So you can, you can see what your, what your heart rate was overnight. Like, right. And if you, if you compare it, like, um, you know, on a regular night, you go to bed normal and just get a night's sleep. And, you, and you, your heart rate, you look at your heart rate and you look at it. Uh, after a night where you even had one or two beers, your your heart rate is elevated overnight. Really, hundred percent. Yeah, no question. You have to be. You have to have your poise as a doctor. I imagine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really, one thing you can't afford is to lose your shit. That's what it is. But this 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 is nothing, dude. I'm chilling. I'm sitting here. I'm scrolling Twitter, and I'm I'm sipping my my non alcoholic beer. <laughs> I'm I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, dri I'm like a I'm like a like I'm diffusing a bomb right now. Oh, like I'm sweating. You are dripping sweat. Am I dripping sweat? Is it like profuse? <laughs> Let's take a look. That's unbelievable. I always sweat. I sweat like crazy anyway. So it's nothing new to me. I have a question for you. Have you sure. ever seen uh, Ex Machina? So I've never seen Ex Machina, oh. but I've heard I've heard amazing things about oh, it. Oh yeah, it's an amazing science fiction movie. It's incredible. But the important thing is, uh, hmm, I wonder what your wife's gonna say about this. But you actually kind of look like Oscar Isaac in that movie. Do with I? This beard. Yeah, man. I'll like, take that. I, yeah, you should. I mean, Oscar Isaac is having a moment. He's very popular. Right, and, right. You know, Moon Knight and obviously Star Wars. And, yeah, yeah. Attractive yeah. man. Uh, very attractive man. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that. Yeah, Dune. You should. You should. I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's great. He's great in Dune. Yeah. He's great in Dune. So you're saying with the with the kids. Yeah, yeah. Right. So my kids are seven and three. Yours are three and one. Three and one. And the chaos that ensues with that. Oh, yeah. And well, yeah. Well, that's what I was getting at. You were you were saying like uh, you, you feel crotchety after and you check your watch and it turns out you had a rough night's sleep. And I think that's true. I think another hidden factor is how much just emotional work have you spent on the kids that day how how, how hard have yeah. the kids been you know like uh how many times they melted down how many negotiations have you dealt with or whatever <laughs> like you know i i just find like you know if you've done four hours of that 
I mean, honestly, it's the same as doing a freaking one hour run. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. It, it, there is, there is uh, like, it's like when you read about like chess players and the amount of calories they can burn with their brains, like in a chess match, it's like yes. parenting has to be burning a significant amount of calories uh, from the stress level, the amount that your brain is just constantly. And then the refrain aspect has to be worth a few calories alone when you could kind of suppress any type of outburst that you want to have. Right. I mean, yes, exactly. You just, you just have to be patient and, that's incredibly difficult. Everything, everything in our current culture and society trains us to not be patient. And <laughs> yeah, especially Amazon Prime, right? Yeah, That's the Amazon number one Prime. culprit yeah. of why we're not patient yeah. as a culture. Yeah, I was, you know, I, I was not patient enough to, uh, to wait for you to fix your equipment. I, I opened <laughs> up my phone. I was like, I need some new ideas here. What can, what can you give me? <laughs> I need some exactly. <laughs> um, I want to like, how did you get into medicine? How did you get to becoming a doctor? Because. Yeah. And I want to talk about the article you wrote and everything that you, you've done, but um, was it a clear path for you or is it something that kind of unfolded before you? Like, what was your route to becoming a doctor? Right. right. Yeah, my, my route was, I mean, I always loved science and particularly chemistry and, you know, the chemistry of life. That was that was my my road into it. You know, I, I, I really thought for a long time that I was going to go into basic science research. Um, and, you know, that was kind of the beginning of my career and my studies. Um, but, you know, after spending some time there, I just I just wanted to do some more practical stuff and get my hands dirty and and help people. So that's that's the direction it went. I mean, and I wound up in emergency medicine, which is probably the most practical specialty there is, you know. Why so? Well, because it's kind of the first line of defense in modern medicine in, in a lot of ways. I mean, primary care has an argument there as well. But in emergency medicine, you know, it, it's kind of what you think of when you think of a doctor. Somebody has a problem. My my belly hurts. My head hurts. You know, and they and they come to the emergency room, and you know they want a to feel better and and be an answer as to what's going on and if it's dangerous and that's our job to figure it out. You know, and it it and in that sense, it's it's very satisfying. But I mean, you could be a regular. I mean, I don't say regular doctor, but an emergency room doctor obviously adds a certain level of. I don't even know what word to use extremism, you know, obviously, you know, thinking on your feet, acting on your feet, why emergency room right. a a area? Yeah. I mean, like, was it something that you were just able to like, did it like tap into your most doctor version of you where you're like, I can't even have an opportunity to think I just have to, you know, act type of thing. Yeah. I enjoy that. I, I, I enjoyed responding to emergencies and stabilizing people, you know, people come in, with well, you know, I trained at Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx, sure, which is sure, a level one trauma center, and you know that's where we got like you know gunshot wounds and you know um, you know uh, stabbings, all all sorts of trauma, you know, unbelievable trauma, and you know now I don't work in a trauma hospital, but we do still deal with with medical emergencies, people presenting in cardiac arrest with you know heart attacks, and yeah, I mean it's incredibly satisfying to you know, to meet those people at the door and to, you know, try to save their lives. You know, it's an, it's an exciting job. You know, as I said, as we were saying about at the top, you know, when you come in, you have to be ready to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few beers in and you're like, ah, <laughs> no, no. you really can't, you have to really have a, a clear head with things. Is it something that it does kind of put you in that like flow state? Cause I know I, I obviously we know each other. Is it jujitsu first, then CrossFit or CrossFit, then jujitsu? I was me. thinking about this. <laughs> You mean in terms of what I like? I, yeah. Well, I meant in regards to how we know each other. It was CrossFit oh. first, right? Dude, I don't even. You went to Pop. I went to Northeast. Oh, okay. okay. And I thought I thought we did. I, I I knew you from like that community in some way, shape, oh. or form. I was there a couple times. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we met primarily at uh, at Igor's. At Igor's. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Does it get me? Is it is it a flow state kind of thing? I think it is. I th I think it absolutely is. You know, it, especially in in resuscitations and. You know, you have to clear your mind and that you have to be very present and you have to be res responding to only that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's fair to say. Yeah, you can't be, you know, resuscitating someone and thinking about like this fucking like you can't like you have to check everything at the door and walk into that space as clear as possible. Do you have any type of like meditative practices or any type of like practices that you do journaling or anything like that that mm -hmm. allows you to like dump out kind of the day or go into it with a clear head? No, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a fair point. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it's similar to dealing with any kind of like pressure situation, you know, 
And so at this point, I have a lot of practice dealing with pressure situations. I've been doing it for years. And, you know, residency, we do it practically ad nauseum, you know, we did hundreds of times. And so, you know, you just um, – you get very, very proficient at it. And I, I do think, though, you know, you're, you really raise a good point. I'm not sure if I've even thought about this before, but like, yeah, it's the same reason I like, um, you know, in, in competitive sports or, in, and things like that. You know, when I used to play like pickup basketball and now when I do jujitsu, stuff like that, that's the only thing that you can be thinking of. And you're totally focused and, and you're thinking of your next move. So, you know, it's a good point of comparison. Yeah, I, I think jujitsu is definitely uh, the microcosm of the macro, right? And there are moments where I, I'm not going to lie to you, where I'm like, you know, someone has my back and they're going for a choke or something. And my mind will just be like, well, I'm leaving this situation now because I don't want to be here right now. And I'm like, what do I have to pick up at the store after this? Or like, what am I having for dinner? And like, and then I'm like, what are you doing? Someone's trying to kill you right now. Right. You might want to focus on on that, you know, first and foremost, rather than what's for dinner after this. Right, totally. And, and you know. I, I think of like sometimes um, when, when, you know, something bad happens to you in jujitsu, that's almost when you're at most risk for another bad thing happening to you in jujitsu. <laughs> because, like, you know, you, sometimes you get like, you get swept. And you're like, ah, can we curse on the computer? Yeah, 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 100%. You're like, ah, fuck. I yeah. just got swept. Yeah. And then the next thing, like, while you're still like mad at yourself, he passes you or whatever. Right. You know, so right. that's, you know, so, right. It's, it's, it's yeah, sitting, in sitting in that space and allowing that to kind of, you know, have its its way with your mind now opens up opportunity for the other person because you're now now combating the next thing. You're just kind of focused on the past thing. It makes you have to be super um like super super present. There's no way around. There's it. no time to even you know yeah to say this sucks. You just have to be okay. This is my position now, and that's fine. What can I do from here? Yeah, yeah. In dealing with trauma, obviously there's there's a myriad of things that you can kind of come up against, right? Mm -hmm. How do you kind of internalize those things like are, are you able to kind of check those things at the door or, or do you like you know it's kind of hard not to take some of that stuff home with you yeah i mean um the hardest things you do absolutely take home with you i mean there's there's just like no getting around it you know um i think that was especially true again you know when i when i worked at a you know at a major trauma center and seeing you know especially like you know young people who who have tragic accidents and you know they don't always have good outcomes I mean, some of the worst things, you know, it just, yeah, it, it just stays with you, actually it stays with you forever. I mean, I remember when I was like an intern, that intern is the first year after medical school, you know, you rotate, you do rotations throughout the hospital because you're still learning, right? Right. And I rotated through like the surgical ICU. And like at the time, the surgical ICU was not one, but I think three, like young men in their 20s, paralyzed, uh, paraplegic uh, from gunshot wounds, you know, to the spine and with you know, uh, with damage and, you know, those people will never walk again. It's just, you know, there's, there's not much you can do for them, you know, from, from this, obviously there are things, but their lives are never going to be the same. You know right. what I mean? And yeah, so you can't, uh, you know, but in that moment when you're, when you're there, the emotional part is not, is not a component for me anyway. You know, you're, you're doing your algorithm of, of what we've been trained to do, which is like ABCs. It's like airway breathing circulation. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's really kind of the formula for stabilizing people. Although not to get too technical, but it has changed. Let's get technical. <laughs> Fuck it. Why not? <laughs> yeah, let's get technical. Let's outkick some coverage here. Like, I, don't, I don't know anything about, I was like, I'm on it. Let's dive in. So let's get super technical okay. again. I Why mean, not? Yeah. So, you know, in emergency medicine, it's, it's, the classic training is ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. So you don't have to be a freaking rocket scientist to, to figure that out. Like, you know, they come in the door, they're like, ah, ah, they're blue, they're choking, right? right. Like, that's, that's a life-threatening situation. Uh, and, you know, any life-threatening situation, you go through basically the things that can kill people the fastest. So the thing generally that can kill people the fastest you may know this from jujitsu is, is airway issues right sure. so you're choking and then there's an obstruction you can't oxygenate ventilate and so we secure you know an airway um and the b is breathing meaning is there you know adequate muscles of respiration that are that are moving air to to perform the function of right right, right right so that you know that we we breathe for them by either bagging or putting them on a ventilator and then c is circulation so i mean are they you know, in hemorrhagic shock, are, are they bleeding to death sort of thing? Um, and we can, you know, rapidly have procedures to rapidly, rapidly just transfuse blood, basically. But my, my point before was that it has changed a little bit in modern times from the battlefield, you know, basically insights from the battlefield. 
is that in some situations you really should, you really, really need to focus on like circulation issue first, uh, particularly in, in potential hemorrhagic shock. So like, like limb loss or something like that. So, you know, you can bleed to death rapidly from, this is great conversation. I love it. Listen, no, listen, I love it. Continue. <laughs> Go on. You can bleed to death really, really fast. So, I mean, so, um, so some, some, in some situations you really should consider instead of ABC, like CAB, you should, you know, apply a tourniquet and rapid transfusion. Sure. It makes sense. Those. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. At least, so. and, and any of any field where, and again, not to use jujitsu as the parallel, but why not any yeah. field where you have to think on your feet, right? Mm -hmm. it, it cannot be so linear, like the ABC thing. Yeah. It's practical. It makes sense. Like that would be the, you know, the order of operation of which you should go and approach this person. But if their arm is, is, is off and they're <laughs> bleeding out, you yeah. might want to handle yeah. the elf in the room, so to right. speak, and, and approach that first. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, of course it, yeah. And it can be, it can be a little bit more complicated because say someone um, was in the vicinity, you know, a grenade went off or something. They're a poly trauma, right? Sure. And so they, you know, and so they don't appear to be like. And near Jacoby, that's completely possible that a grenade <laughs> went off. No, I'm from I'm no. from that area, so uh, you know, a, a grenade going oh, off yeah. in that area. I have not <laughs> seen a grenade go off. Um, <laughs> one time, one time we had uh, uh, a, a tiger assault victim. Did you really? Yes, we did. That was that was uh, my that was also my intern year, and uh, somebody. Um, Somebody jumped into the uh, the tiger enclosure in the Bronx Zoo, yeah, and with uh, like intent or like was it intent, like hey we're intent. gonna we're gonna you know it was you know, it was, you know sadly a, like suicide by tiger kind of situation. Oh yeah yeah. So that's that was his goal, and they managed to like get him off, and like he he came in as as a poly trauma, as you might imagine. So what what was the scenario like? What was like was his arm? He was in shock. I mean, you know, he had multiple bites and scratches. And he was bleeding. He had to go to the operating room. He needed bilateral chest tubes to drain blood that was, you know, around his lungs. And so, yeah, I mean, it was the, it was the whole deal. That's, that's a really extreme way, right? Like, it, so obviously nothing to joke about with suicide. Of course not. Like, that's very sad that he was in such a state that he felt that he wanted to take his own life. There's yeah. not making a joke of that or making light of that. But there are so many ways to go about doing that, sadly. Death by tiger, probably not. The most common not what you would choose but you know he, i mean he had he had deep psychological issues sure i imagine yeah. so yeah. um do you come across a lot of people who are coming into the emergency room i'm sure you do and it's not what they anticipate it being like it's really just gas or something like that hmm. oh oh yeah, yeah man. <laughs> i mean that's, i mean that's the that's the i mean like the bulk of our of our of our work i would say or so you know all right like what percentage of people sure. come in and they're like i'm dying you're like no you mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. x y and you have gas i would say most people don't come in so dramatic although a handful do but a lot of people come in with with that and this is really you know we were talking about like um you know the resuscitations and the critically ill patients and that's like kind of like pillar one of what makes the job really difficult but i would say pillar two and really just as difficult is that is that hundreds of people present with non-specific complaints, complaints like chest pain or abdominal pain or headache and or dizziness. And these are things that could either be nothing or they can be, you know, they could be very serious and life-threatening things like, you know, like stroke, heart attack, you know, intra-abdominal sepsis or whatever. So um, that's, that is, that is probably the most challenging part of the job is like separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, you know, uh, finding out who's sick in, yeah. in that whole general population. There's, you know, there's like probably like 150 people a day who present with like nonspecific complaints. And, you know, we got to figure out and some probably about a third of them have something dangerous, you know, and yeah. So, you know, a lot of people have chest pain. What, what you have chest pain because of, you know, because of like muscles, you could have chest pain um, because of like reflux or gastritis. Sure. You could have chest pain because of like skin conditions. I mean, pulmonary conditions, or you could have chest pain because, you know, you're having a heart attack. Right. I'm sure there was a huge uptick of that with COVID, right? I'm sure that there was a huge amount of uptick of people thinking they had COVID and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature when, when that became or was at its peak, no? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, in March and April of, well, it was 2020. Right? <laughs> what year was it again? <laughs> March and April of whatever year it was? March yeah, yeah, yeah. March and April of 2020. It was a horror show. It was absolutely unbelievable. It was, uh, you know, uh, it was we could we, we didn't have enough stretchers i mean you know we didn't never we didn't have enough 
equipment in general. We didn't have enough ventilators. We didn't have enough stretchers. We didn't have enough space. We're just like all on top of each other. And we didn't have enough tanks and all these people were on oxygen. It was terrifying. I mean, it was a terrifying time. You know, we didn't have any treatments at the time either. After that first wave, I would say like every subsequent wave, and some of them have been pretty bad, but nothing matched, you know, the intensity or pain, frankly, of, of, of that time period. Was that mainly, and I imagine I'm going to answer my own question here, but was that mainly because of the huge unknown factor in it? Or was it just the amount of people that were coming in with, whether it be COVID or thoughts or that they had COVID? Yeah. No, these people had COVID. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no way around it. Yeah. They, they, you know, they came in with, uh, you know, oxygen saturation. You're supposed to have, walking around, you have an oxygen saturation of 98, 100%. You know, pe- I'm talking about hundreds of people coming in with oxygen saturations, like around 80 or, you know, in the 70s, needing oxygen. And yeah, this was, you know, this they all really had COVID. It wasn't, it wasn't a mental thing at that time. <laughs> right, right, right. For sure. It wasn't, it didn't seep its way into the culture yet the way it has now where, you know, people are like, oh, maybe, you know, it's weird because again, that was such a weird time because, you know, whatever side of the fence you lie on with conspiracy, not conspiracy, your belief, whatever it is, it's just the flu, it's a cold, whatever your thoughts are. Uh, it was a real thing that, you know, we've never interfaced with as a culture, like such a pandemic. And there was no way to really handle it, in my opinion, other than the way it was handled. Could there have been some cleanup? Absolutely. Uh, but I think for the most part, things were done to the best of their ability. But, you know, you did see the, you know, the pictures and all the videos online of the hospitals and, you know, overseas. And, there, you know, is it is it blown out of proportion? Is it real? So, you know, without having boots on the ground in that, in that experience right. from the outside looking, it's like, well, what do I even believe at this point? Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, I, I forget what the exact number was, but like, was it like 0.1% that experienced severe COVID, which, which would, you know, necessitate, you know, oxygen and, and hospitalization. So there's kind of like two ways to view like 0.1%, right? Like right. it's, it's, that's one in a thousand. I know a thousand people like nobody right. got, nobody got severe COVID, but if you look on a population level <laughs> and that there's hundreds of thousands or millions of people in the area, right. um, guess what? One in a thousand is plenty to, to overwhelm the, the medical system. And that's exactly what it did. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the problem is that we, we look at things from our Google street view. Right. And it's just like, well, I look at it from, you know, my little house in my little neighborhood and that's how I view the world. And it's just like, no, you need to really go to like a Google earth view yeah. and, you know, expand out and zoom out and see how it's affecting, you know, and that goes with, with anything, whether it be the, you know, the flow of the universe or the yin and yang of life, yeah. you know, we, we question, Oh, why is this happening? Why is this? And it's like, well, from our small little humanistic view of things, we think we have an answer. Or we have to ask the question why. Right. But when you zoom out, it's like, well, this is just the order of upper. This is just the way the world right, works man. and the universe works. So, right, man. I mean, and, and that's why it's important in life to like to seek out new perspectives at all times. You know what I mean? I, I think that's um, that's a great function of this podcast and what you do. You know, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, if you if you just stay in your, you know, in your little, I guess, bubble might be the word that we use these days. Sure. And like, you don't challenge yourself and expose yourself to other ideas. You know, you're not going to experience any growth and you're not likely to achieve any wisdom. So, you know, I, 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 I think it's, it's wise to seek other perspectives and, and do so in as many ways as possible. Is that, is that something that's hard to do in like the medical field? Because it's so, I, I would imagine it's pretty competitive and there's a lot of intellectuals that obviously don't want to come off as wrong, right? There's, there's a lot of money involved in that world. So is that something that's hard to, to kind of achieve is, is your own individual thought and perspective of things? Do you have to somewhat conform to what people are thinking and saying? Well, you know, in medicine, I, it's a little bit different from, I don't know, from culture in a way. I mean, you know, we, we pride ourselves on using, you know, we, we, we think we, we use the scientific method, you know, and we have peer reviewed journals and teams of really smart people who think about these things. And, you know, we, we rely on, on their judgments and on our own judgments from, from, from reading like scientific journals. And so, you know, there is definitely room for like on the margins of like what is known in terms of science, what is definitive and stuff like that, you know? And I think that doctors generally do sometimes can do a better job of, of giving each other leeway when the science is not deciphered yet, you know, is not totally right. like laid bare. But, you know, I think they, we do a, a in general, a, a decent job of that, you know? Yeah, because I imagine like with peer reviewed papers and, and things of that nature, that people are kind of shitting on other people's ideas just for the sake of it, just to whether it be, and, and it doesn't have to necessarily be doctors, but you see that in culture anyway, people right. are just 
have to have this the the cut of their jib if you will mm -hmm. right that's just kind of uh you know questioning which is important to question but almost question or or be combative or con confrontational just for the sake of it yeah well i mean in a way what, what you're talking about is bias i guess and like there and bias it creeps into like you know everything in life and does creep into like science and scientific studies and so that's why actually like you know the randomized controlled trial is kind of the gold standard of science because it, it does as much as almost everything that can possibly be done to to avoid bias and basically randomized control trial is basically patients are randomized you come in you have a 50 50 chance uh and you're going to either receive the medication or placebo right, right right and the doctor doesn't know what you get and the patient doesn't know what what he or she gets and you just record the result at the end you know and um and you and you figure it out and so studies that that do the most to remove bias are given the most weight by you know medical professionals and scientists in general how much of from your experience and obviously you're in a little bit of a different field so to speak correct me if i'm wrong than just like the medicine aspect of it could because you're in such an emergency case how much of that of the placebo comes into effect in what you do mm -hmm. and then also just in in medicine alone and kind of in the medical field mm -hmm. i think i think the placebo effect first of all is obviously real and yeah and, it's hard <laughs> to deny at this point right <laughs> yeah and and also like perhaps a useful tool you know um sometimes you know people just want to feel better and you know making people feel better in terms of goals that's that's not a bad goal you know and so i think that you know i i i for instance will use something of a, of a placebo effect let me give you an example if you don't mind yeah please um so if, like somebody comes in with pain that i know is um is musculoskeletal okay you know from whatever from the history and physical exam i know now there have been like randomized controlled studies that show that like an oral like naproxen or motrin will be just as effective as like an intramuscular toradol uh, right. with toradol being it's kind of like an iv form of, of motrin or ibuprofen okay but my subjective experience has been that the patients that i treat are are more satisfied and feel better following administration of intramuscular toradol and i think the reason for that is that you know they the placebo effect they yeah. feel like they came to the hospital they got a shot the doctor took me seriously and now i feel better you know and so yeah i think there is a placebo effect and why not you take advantage of it if it so when you're giving that shot, is it is it actually anything or it's nothing? No, no, it's 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 basically Motrin. Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. so there's no there's no placebo to that, but it's just more the pomp and circumstance that's going along with it, and like you know, obviously you know, getting a shot and exactly. kind of what it all the, the preparation of that and what that actually feels like. So so there's in comparison, just like here, take this Advil. Right. The placebo aspect of it is the the shot versus the oral intake of medication. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense that you would you would think that, you know, being in a in a scenario where like, like you said, like you're taken more seriously rather than like, here's an Advil, get out of here, you yeah. crazy kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you might have uh, a little bit of a, of a difference there. I'm curious in regards to, you know, the article that you wrote about Alzheimer's, yeah. because I, I've no I've known one person who had Alzheimer's. It was a friend's grandmother. Um, and I was younger, significantly younger. But I remember her saying like, oh, you're such a pretty little girl. Would you like a cookie? Mm. And I was just like, wow, this is weird. Like it felt like as a little kid, right? It felt like that scene in Home Alone when he's lost in the city and just like all the adults are big and you're kind of like, oh, this is kind of scary. Yeah. Um, so I vividly remember that. What led you to the study of Alzheimer's and kind of what made you dive into, into that paper that you wrote specifically? And Sure. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I mean, where do you start with dementia? I mean, is so it, is question is dementia most, alzheimer's same thing alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia yeah there are other causes of dementia but alzheimer's is far and away the most common there's six million people in the united states right now with alzheimer's dementia and you know there's there's going to be tens of millions you know by by 2050. So, wow yeah so it's a huge huge problem did it has it affected you personally if you don't mind me asking yes yeah okay. my grandmother has dementia and you know i honestly you know <sighs> I mean, is it the most feared disease? It's the most feared disease by me. I mean, you know, sure. I, you know, it, ta it takes away, it takes away at the core of your identity, you know, it takes away yeah. what you are and makes you a burden to people, you know, and, sure. um, you know, and it's just sad, you know, I think, I think, mo I think, you know, if you talk to most people, they would, you know, they'd far rather die than, ex than experience dementia. Right. So yeah, of course. Yeah. So, 
it gets right to the heart of like, you know, human dignity, which is, which that's what everyone wants, right? You want, you want dignity and, and dementia kind of robs you of that. And it, but you know, and what's so like sad and kind of compelling about it is that to this point before 2021, there was not a single drug ever developed that, that treated the, um, the underlying cause of dementia and treated the actual dementia, all medications that had been developed actually just really just treated the symptoms. So example of like, how would it treat a symptom? So like a symptom of, of dementia might be like agitation, like, you know, like they don't know what's going on. They're confused. And so they, you know, they thrash, they might hurt themselves. They might hurt somebody else. Sure. And so to help, you know, calm them down, sedate them essentially. Right. Right. Um, so this medication, Aduhelm, um, Biogem developed it. It's, it was the first, it's the first medication to treat the underlying cause of dementia. And what do we know at this point, what the underlying cause is? That is a really good question. So there is a working theory that is not, that is not proven. So it's the amyloid hypothesis. Um, and basically what it is, is there's a buildup of a protein called amyloid in the brain over time. Um, some people develop it this, this faster than others. Okay. And that causes a cascade of problems downstream from it. Uh, this buildup of the protein in the brain. Where does it build up in the brain? In, in the white matter. Okay. Uh, so, or, and yeah, in, in the cortex, this basically causes all sorts of problems. It causes tangles uh, in the in the cells, neurofibrillary tangles in the cells, and basically causes the, the the neurons to communicate with each other more poorly and and to die. Okay, and so this medication, um, it's a it's an infusion. It's an infusion of an antibody, and basically what this an antibody is like, it's like a mini protein goes into the into the um, the tissue. It, connects to the amyloid. It connects directly to the amyloid. It basically tells your body, your body's white blood cells to clean it up, to, to, to degrade it essentially. So it targets the, um, the amyloid. Uh, Biogem had studies. It proved conclusively that, that it reduces the amyloid in brains when they, when they treat with this. But what the, the question was is, does it actually improve the outcomes of people with dementia? Does it, does it, does it stop the progression of dementia? And the, that's kind of where I got interested in this because I was following it. Obviously, I'm very interested. I, I do some research on efficacy of other medications in the emergency room. And, you know, so this is kind of a subtopic that I'm interested in. Yeah. So what's an example of like uh, something that you'd be interested in that field? So just like the emergency room aspect of, mm -hmm. of I guess, uh, medication or things that are implemented in an emergency room situation. Sure. We, in my emergency department, we do a lot of research around migraines and like what, what treatments are effective for, for migraines. We do, there's different drugs. We also do like basically lidocaine injections to occipital um, uh, lidocaine injections. And we also look at, at, at pain and we do studies like with opioids and stuff like that. So uh, involved in a lot, a bunch of different studies around medications and their efficacy. But anyway, so yeah, so, uh, okay. So um, Biogen and Adrihelm. So yeah, so it does definitely reduce the amyloid, which everyone thinks is what's causing dementia ultimately. But they did two studies, and one study showed that it reduced the progression of dementia by 40% or so, okay? And the other study did not show a positive effect, okay? So they had two studies. So now is it, is it stopping the dementia from, you said, progressing? So it's stopping the dentist tracks. It's not doing any reverse work. Correct. It's just stopping, you know, where it is not even stopping where it is. It's, it's, it's progressing 40% slower than you would have expected, essentially. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's still happening. Exactly. There's no way to stop it dead in its tracks, nope. but it's slowing down the process exactly. of the dementia on setting. Right. And the idea is, you know, if you target people early in the, you know, Alzheimer's process that, you know, if with, you know, years of this treatment, you might get an extra, you know, one or two functional years, maybe, you know, of, of life, which would obviously be, be meaningful to people. <laughs> sure. Is there, is there a standard turnaround time with Alzheimer's and dementia? Like, is there kind of a window there that it's, it, it naturally progresses at a certain rate and mm -hmm. does that rate speed up at a certain time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it kind of progresses like in a, in a linear way rather than a, an exponential way. And the way they me measure it, you know, they have these very technical tests that, um, that they, that they, that they do on these patients. And they, you know, they ask them questions about their orientation. They make them do different drawings. They have different like verbal tests and stuff like that. And basically they compare their, their results on like on these tests, you know, before and, and after a time period. Um, and, you know, yeah. And, you know, as, as you were saying, dementia 
Alzheimer's dementia progresses and it progresses in a pretty linear fashion, you know, progressively more disabling as time goes on. Yeah. It's interesting. I said, it's, it's like, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the exact term you use, but like the sense of loss of identity and dignity, mm-hmm. you know, because I think from my standpoint, again, and I only had very limited interaction with someone with Alzheimer's, it, it was, it, that's a really beautiful but sad way to put it right because there is a sense of dignity that's lost there there is a sense of identity that's lost there Mm -hmm. because there is this retrieval that's obviously not transpiring of of who who you are where you are there seems to be also a lot of fallback to old old thoughts and kind of old placement of things do we know what kind of where that stems from i i don't know on like on a scientific way but you know i I think you know on a just, you know, uh, like human level. I mean, there's certain thoughts, emotions, and ideas that are like more core to your identity than others. And they're, 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 they're a little bit harder to erase, you know what I mean? And probably the last to go in a lot of ways, but you know, yeah, just going back to the dignity thing, like I'm, I'm not in no way saying that obviously that, that people with dementia don't have dignity, but you know, the potential to lose your dignity is there. You know, oh, no, you know, no, yeah. I, I totally, yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. It's not that they don't have it, but it, it, it is something that sadly is deteriorating, right? Like your, your, your body's ability to function, your body's ab- like the last thing that you have, which is your mind at, at the very least, even if you don't have the physical ability to, to do anything, you still have your mind, but to have that deteriorate, right. um, there is a sense of dignity that's, that is progressively being lost. Right. Um, and there's kind of, and that's a really, I don't want to say beautiful, but that is a really humanistic way to look at it rather than it just being this disease that's deteriorating people. And, oh, well, you know, there is this sense of humanistic identity that we have that when you start to lose that, no matter what it is um, or that's causing that, it's it's very sad to see. Yeah. And I think it gets to like some some really like interesting questions of like, you know, what what is your identity? <laughs> is, you, is your identity your brain, you know? Um, it might be, but, but if it isn't, or if it is, then um, it's, it's interesting how, just how malleable it is. And by ma- malleable, even by processes, you know, beyond your control. So for instance, you know, like people who have suffered a head trauma, you know, they, they frequently experience like personality changes and things like that. You know, it's beyond their control. You know, is there an identity beyond, beyond the brain and the mind? You know what I mean? I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think that there is, I mean, I think of like children, right? I, 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 I like to see the world, especially having children. I do my best to kind of see it through their eyes, right? Mm-hmm. I think that that's something that we lose as adults as we, as we get older, right? We lose that innocence to life, right? And I think it's, it's super important, especially once you have children, that that perspective somewhat comes back. I mean, do you agree with that? That you, yeah. you kind of start to see the world? That's one, I mean, that's one of the true gifts of, of being a parent, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, you can see the world through fresh eyes again. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think that in that, I mean, and tell me about with your kids, like I see my children like through, I see through them. Like that's the only way to put it is like, I see through my children. Mm -hmm. And, and it's funny because my children will see through me too. Mm -hmm. Right. Like my girl will say to me, and she's a very, uh, you know, I hate to say she's an old soul, but she Mm -hmm. is a very, I'll just say old soul for lack of a better term right now. Uh, What happened? Precocious. Yeah, for sure. To say the least. Um, And she'll, she'll say like, she could see through me too, in some way, shape and form. And it's, it's, it's amazing to see, but going back to the identity piece, I think that, you know, that identity of who you are is, is something that's intrinsic, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably something beyond our even conception of identity. And, you know, we start to lose that identity based off of cultural norms and expectations. And we start to form different identities naturally, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have to adapt to our environments through school, through, through life. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think the essence of a person, you know, is, is potentially their identity, like, you know, the soul maybe. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You believe in a soul? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Do you as I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, maybe I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I just, I just think it's unknowable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I listen, I think it's like anything else. Like I, I I'll, I'll go the step further. like, how do we even know if this is real, right? Like this yeah. could be, this could be the matrix. Like who knows this could be the metaverse. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to question, I'm a very, and I've been accused of it. Like I'm a very deep thinker. Right. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just be like, but 
the levels of depth don't stop where you want them to just because it's not convenient anymore for people. I think that's where people go, well, no, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the very least it's worth questioning. Right. Mm -hmm. And in regards to a soul, it's, you know, what is, what does it actually even mean? Like, like to your point, like it's, it's, it, we don't know that. Right. right. Um, and there's a level of faith that doesn't have to be a religious faith that's there. Right. Um, it could just be a sense of, of feeling. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. A sense of feeling. I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, if, if not a soul, then, I mean, I certainly believe in, you know, I guess I, I find it a little hard to characterize, but you know, a human spirit or something that maybe is perhaps a little bit more like collective than, than something as like individual as a soul. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's an individuality there that, that spins off or spirals off of the collective, mm -hmm. right? So perhaps like like a tree, right? Like yeah. you have different branches that stem off and then you have leaves and you have all these other components of the tree, right? But collectively, it's if you look at it, it's still just a tree, right? Yeah. The tree is all one thing, but it's made up of all these multiple parts that die and live and reborn and mm -hmm. come back. And there's parts that are underground and parts that you see and some parts are beautiful and some parts rot. So I think there's a collective unit that we all feel right. I, I definitely think that there's a collective unit uh, that brings us all together because there is something that we all feel intrinsically, right? right? There is something that, you know, we all, whether it be conversing in your own mind or your own relationship with your thoughts, but we all have this, this humanistic experience that we can definitely connect and is interwoven, but not on the tangible side, but on the intrinsic side. That's beautiful, man. <laughs> that was good. That was good. This wow. is not alcoholic <laughs> here. Yeah, no substances were involved. Yeah, no, in nothing, fight. nothing. Are you familiar with um, the uh, the so-called hard problem of consciousness? Um, not specifically. Maybe I know it in in its, but not specifically okay. labeled okay. as that. So, so yeah, yeah. So it it it, it, kind of, it seems like we might be circling a little bit. I just want to maybe like let's circle. Yeah, let's do it. So the okay. So you know the hard problem. There are like the easy problems of consciousness. So what's an easy problem yeah, of consciousness? An easy problem of consciousness is like, how, how, how do we think? Or like, you know, how do we see? Or like, what, what are the connections in the brain that enable us to do like different things? Sure. You know, they're very, very difficult problems to solve. There's actually nothing like really easy about them, but you can actually perceive of like a scientific process that would eventually answer those questions okay so, so like sc mri scans and things of that nature you can watch the synapses fire off you can see the parts of the brain that are highlighted during like dopamine and serotonin exactly. and there are things that are being tangibly so to speak recognized that something is transpiring right okay the hard problem of consciousness is that is something that to this point or with existing scientific ideas we don't have even a way to test or begin to figure it out and this the the hard problem of consciousness is that so you know everything that we perceive and do is a result of like physical processes that are occurring you right. know like photons are like coming into my eyeball it goes through a nerve goes to the back of my brain generates an image you know it's all it's all particles man it's all atoms right. and cells and like physical matter that's doing stuff right. okay so you you could you could explain all that physical matter and what it's doing till the cows come home but the question remains why do I have a subjective experience as a result of those physical processes occurring? That's, that's the question. Why does it feel, why does it feel, why does it feel like me to be me when, when those things occur? There's no, there's no real scientific way to, 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 to get your hands around that. You know, I, I, okay. So what comes up for me in that is that that's, where the identity piece comes in. That's where the individual piece comes in. That's where the ego comes in. That's where the, 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 id, the ego, the, that's where all of the humanistic experiences come in, in needing to explain that. Because I think that underlining all of it, there is, we're all the same. I think that there isn't a difference between human to human. It's just the human experience that we're having that's different. And because the human experience is different, we internalize that and say that we're different. But, you know, your your wedding band's rubber and black, my wedding band's rubber and gray, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's these commonalities, and that's just obviously just a, a small example, but there's these humanistic feelings and experiences that we have that are undeniably the same. 
the levels may be different, right? Someone's trauma might be different than someone else's trauma. There's no denying that. And it's not to make someone's trauma less or more than, but the experience and the feeling that's behind it in its essence and in the root of it is identical. And that's what we're all connected by. It's the humanistic experience and the 3D and the tangible space is where we divide ourselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I just no. I, I how's that I, one? I, I agree, that does I, that work? I agree with all that, but I, I, you know, it doesn't. It does not compute that physical processes generate a subjective experience. That that's the thing. It's like, I don't know. I, I have no other way to put it. it. You know, you know. Okay, why should like you know photons bouncing off like that red, white, and blue American flag going into my eye? You know, and they're just like different wavelengths. They ger generate an electrical signal. And uh, you know, hit a cell and all that sort of thing. There's not necessarily a reason why there should be like a creature that feels like a subjective experience as a result of all that. I just think it's very interesting. You know, do you do you think like animal anim like what do you think about animals? You know, do you think they have like a you know a, a consciousness or you know a subjective experience? Obviously, they have a subjective experience. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? Because you think of it like dogs, uh -huh. right? And there, there's something about dogs, and I'm not a, I don't have dogs, you know, I, I like dogs, and I'm not, I, I like dags, but there's something there, right? Like, I remember I went to the zoo with my kids, and we went to the, the gorilla exhibit, mm -hmm. and when you look at a gorilla's eyes, wow. you're like, yeah. I, 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 I question, I was like, is that not a guy in a costume? <laughs> like, you could see yeah. there's something going totally. on, right? Yeah. But then if you look at like a chicken's eyes or like a shark's eyes, right? Jaws, right? Lifeless eyes, dead eyes, like doll's <laughs> eyes, right? Black eyes, like yeah. a doll's eyes. They're dead, right? And yeah. even like fish, right? Yeah. But maybe there's something going on, but maybe it's just at a more reptilian primitive level. right? But like when you look at like a gorilla, right? Mm -hmm. And I looked at this thing dead and it's, I was like, Oh, there's 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 stuff going on back there. They're like you and me could swap bodies. And like it would be like okay for 24 hours. <laughs> we might feel the same thing, right? We might have the same feelings of things. Um, and obviously that's like one of our our closest ancestors, right? Yeah. Like depending on your belief system, but that is you know potentially our closest ancestor uh, in the animal kingdom. Chimps, chimps. Right, right, right. But close enough. Close yeah, enough. Yeah. Um, but it's it's right there, right? It's yeah. it's not too far off from from where we are. Yeah. But maybe that's just something that evolves over time, right? And I, and I don't eat mammals, dude. No, I don't eat mammals. I yeah, I mean it's exactly what you're talking about. I just think that there's there's too much of me in those things, man. Like you know, so you know, a lot of what makes people people is um, the neocortex, okay? Which is like it's a really thin layer of cells on the outer aspect of your brain okay and basically it's it's uh where all higher level like thinking comes right, from right right okay? um and us and other mammals are the only creatures in the animal kingdom that have that so they got it and um you know and nothing else does you know some um birds actually have like they have like an a not like a like a similar kind of thing but like it's not quite the same thing not as developed right it, it's different it's different, uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's not, but anyway, mammals have this same neocortex. It's not, it's not as thick or developed as ours, but to me, you know, if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck. It is a duck meaning, meaning animals, <laughs> mammals look like they, like they think and like act in conscious ways. And they have the neuroanatomy to support the hypothesis that they are thinking and acting creatures. And I don't really want to eat thinking and acting creatures. And so like, so yeah, I don't eat mammals. Really? Yeah. I'll have a stretch where I don't, I'll go on like a stretch where I'm like, I'm just going to eat raw fruits and vegetables. And I definitely feel different. Mm -hmm. Like I definitely feel energetically. And it also depends on what I'm doing, right? Like when I was doing CrossFit, I really didn't do that. But like, if I was doing like yoga and like jujitsu, I'll be like, all right. But then I also feel like I need to like, give my body that like i don't know that like i guess it's taste for blood i don't know i don't know how else to put it but when i do go on like a raw fruits and vegetables you know week or stretch mm -hmm. it's usually based out of this idea that i'm like i'm just tired of eating yeah. right like there's something about that where i'm like i don't desire anything right now like yeah. nothing seems appealing to me so i'm just gonna go like raw fruits and vegetables and kind of you know kind of an elimination diet i guess you could say yeah. Yeah, well, I'll eat the fuck out of a chicken. I yeah. don't give a fuck about those guys. Okay, so, 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 I said, <laughs> so that, I mean, you can't, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I said mammals. So, okay. yeah, so I eat chicken, I eat turkey, 
you know, fish, shrimp, okay. all that sort of stuff. Right. Um, yeah. You know, you know, yeah. I, like we were getting, we were talking about like this continual continuum of consciousness or whatever. And like, you know, so yeah, I, th- I think that like birds, especially, and, and even fish and I, I do getting metaphysical on it. Like potentially everything like has some like level of consciousness, like atomic consciousness. It, you know, basically we don't understand consciousness at all, like where it comes from, you know, but, right. but indubitably on there's like, there seems to be some continuum and, you know, all living things possess it, you know? Yeah. It, 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 it's hard to say it doesn't because when you watch even like, so we got butterflies and we like watch them unfold, right? We watch the whole process and whatever you're like, there is something there, right? That needs to transpire. Hmm in order for them to come to life, right? Um, and then you mentioned birds, and you see like how birds migrate and how they don't even like, they communicate and like the way, like when you read up on how, you know, the flying V and how they, and the, you know, the, why they do that, or you hear like wolves and the packs and the way they, like, it's hard to say or hard to argue rather that there isn't something that's going on that just because they don't, or dolphins, I mean, perfect example, dolphins, I mean, come on it's hard to say that like there isn't something that's going on and just because we don't understand it uh doesn't mean that it's not transpiring right yeah we don't understand our own consciousness man never mind never mind animals but it's just it's just like you know it's just interesting to consider the whole the whole pyramid of it you know yeah i think i i mean when it comes to consciousness i mean it also depends on what you actually define as that right like what is your definition of mm-hmm. consciousness what is your right. own personal definition yeah, of that you're right you know what is your relationship with that you know have you had experiences where like for me i'm a huge advocate of sensory deprivation you know so i've had experiences in a float tank where i couldn't even tell you what was like i could right mm-hmm. but any word i used in the dictionary would not energetically communicate the feeling mm-hmm. that i got and it it felt like i was pure consciousness it felt like i had no body i had no identity and i was you know i was abundance and void floating through the cosmos right, right? so that is that consciousness is that pure essence that's, of that's consciousness high no yeah. i was <laughs> <laughs> no no i'm just kidding <laughs> You know, dude, I think you actually get in a really good point of like, yeah, I've been a little bit slippery with like how I've been using the word consciousness. I think, yeah, yeah. I think going back to like what we were talking about, the hard problem of consciousness and and like what consciousness is in general, I think that's, I would define that as just having an internal subjective experience, having a sense of like, this is happening to me kind of thing, you know? Well, that, therein lies the thing, right? The subjectivity and having discernment in any situation that's transpiring because we automatically, instinctually, whether it be due to nature, nurture, whatever it is, we automatically internalize the experience and now have to, you know, we can't just have this neutral view of it, right? It kind of goes back to our previous point of like the Google Earth versus the the, the Google Street View, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have to have this, you know, interpretation of experience for our own identity, ego, whatever it is, where there is opportunity in the experience to, again, not very easy to do, but to have a discern point of view and well, not even discern point of view, obviously you show discernment and allow the moment or the experience to only be that. And that's where like stoic philosophy comes in. It's like, don't let anything identify you, you know, other than nothing, essentially. Yeah. Let's talk about how you're avoiding dementia, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not, not because you me sound personally, dementia. do I sound yeah. like I'm losing, do no, I sound no, like no. I have dementia? No, 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 no. Is it not quickly coming not on? Not, not at all. But we got into it a little bit with when you're talking about like your diet and stuff like that. Sure. What, what's, what's your diet look, 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 looking like these days? It's usually intermittent fasting. Uh, and then I'll have a huge bowl of oatmeal with some fruit, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, some honey, uh, flaxseed, uh, chia seed. And then lunch is just depending on what I can get my hands on. Sometimes it's a salad. Sometimes it's a shake. Sometimes it's whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then dinner's a free for all, like <laughs> for the most part, like if it's Friday, I'm putting yeah. down a couple of Heineken's and three slices of pizza. Yeah. 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 Um, that's family life. They, you know, this, that's Friday nights, yeah. you know, um, post jujitsu. It's like one of the best things ever. <laughs> um, lots of sushi, uh, yeah. big sushi person. Um, so when you say intermittent fa- fasting, that's like you eat eight hours a day kind of thing. So I will eat, I try to make my last meal dinner, Mm -hmm. uh, which again, depending on the day is seven o'clock, six, seven o'clock. And then I usually don't eat until uh, 11 o'clock the next day. Okay. 
Yeah, that's that's really good, man. Yeah, it's, I mean, if that that's um that's a pretty good that's a pretty good diet. So I I, I feel like I should uh, since I'm on the podcast just talk about like some of the things that are like actually like food and diet like that would that does actually reduce your risk of dementia. Yeah, and it's actually like um it's really good because it's it it's anything that reduces your or improves your vascular risk factors, meaning anything that would also like improve like your heart health, like actually actually corresponds to like your ultimate, like your brain health. Uh, because you know, it makes sense because I mean, the most important thing is like clean arteries in the brain and like good oxygen, good glucose flow up there and all that sort of thing. So you're, you're on a right track, man. So, I mean, intermittent fasting, excellent for like cardiovascular risk factors and brain health, um, whole grains, that bowl of oatmeal. Excellent. As long as there's not too much added sugar, you know, leafy vegetables, that one's, that one's tough. Like I, I you know, I don't have a taste for, for it myself. No, I love them. That's great, man. Because that's that's huge. How do you, how do you have your vegetables? I whatever. I just steamed, air fryer, oil, a little oil, whatever yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a big leafy green guy. I have no problem with like some spinach, some kale. I'm I'm cool with that. Yeah. Excellent. So then, uh, berries like perfect. A lot of antioxidants in berries. Um, fish. Okay, it's so, like healthy fats, especially like fatty fish, like like salmon. Okay, that that has um. Salmon has like fats in it that your, your body can't make naturally and is necessary for like cognitive function. Uh, so really good, uh, for brain health. And this one's kind of surprising, like beans and legumes. I, they, it's yeah. really recommended. Yeah. I mean, any particular reason why those do those just, I wonder if I'm actually not totally sure. I think it's, it might, might be the fiber fiber. So, yeah. Thing. Yeah. That, that, Protein like, element yeah, of them. The, the fiber I think improves like the cholesterol profile. Yeah, because I mean, they, they do have a, a crazy amount of protein in them, right? Yeah. And uh, obviously, if it's not meat, you know, obviously, it might, you know, supplement that and, and be able to uh, offer the protein element. Yeah, yeah, I've been trying to I, I, I tried to do intermittent fasting as well. It's it I find it challenging. I mean, some days I just I just want breakfast so bad. I just want like, I just want a bowl of cereal or something, you know, yeah. and like, that's what you have. I mean, that's what you have to skip to get to the, the eight hours, right? Yeah, I, but for me, it's, it's it's just become, and again, it's not every day, but it, it honestly is most, you know, and then I was I was doing a full 24-hour fast on Monday, um, so it'd be Sunday dinner, and I wouldn't eat until Monday dinner, uh, but I've kind of done away with that. If I did that, that. And I had to work, it would result in someone's death. <laughs> Without question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, and it might be because I killed him. Right, <laughs> right. No, you get you get to like 3 o'clock on a, like on a, on a 24-hour fast day, and you're just like, I am so talk about whoop responses you're like i am so miserable right yeah. now um but i also think that there's a lot of there's a lot of of return on i don't want to say suffering but going through that misery it's just mm-hmm. like you got to push yourself and i obviously you're a person that does that on a physical level mental level yeah. on, on your in your career um i i just a huge advocate of just like pushing yourself and i'm like do you really need to eat? Like, Good. do you really need yeah. to eat? Or are you just kind of convincing yourself that you need to? Yeah, that intermittent fasting, especially a 24 hour fast, I think it, it induces hormonal changes that um, that are important for longevity. I mean, so it's an excellent thing to do if you can hack it. Yeah. You ever try to fight someone jujitsu on, on during a fast? Have I ever? Uh, so usually if I train, I won't eat anything. Like, even if I'm training like six or seven, I bear like maybe I'll have the oatmeal in the morning, but then after that, I'm not eating because the slightest bit of food in my stomach, I will have to throw up instantly. Mm. I, I do not do well with anything, even like too much water. I'll be like, I'm going to fucking throw up right now. Like, this is no good. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, yeah. I would be, I would just be gassed. I would, I'd need, I'd, I'd be too hungry, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know I'm doing a I'm doing a competition on Saturday actually. Are you? Yeah, yeah. Grappling Industries in Connecticut. Nice. Yeah, man. How did you How did you get into jujitsu? What was like your What was your jujitsu story? Mine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Why is that a question you ask a lot of people? No, no. It's, it's just like I, a- I feel like I feel like um, everyone has it. Like yeah. there's something there's something there that is different, right? Like it, it makes sense. Like you start working out. Like for me, it was like I started working out, just normal conventional gym stuff. Then I got into CrossFit. Uh, my wife got me a, uh, uh, um, a gift certificate to CrossFit. And I was like, all right, all right, I'm into it. And I just was balls deep into CrossFit yeah. just because it was that organized, I don't want to say chaos, but it was, there was this organizational piece that pushed you, right? Like I felt great. And then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu <laughs> came along. And for me, it was, it was this perfect balance 
of I guess where I was in my, uh, where I was in my life when I started, which is only you know four years ago at this point, and we kind of spoke about it a little bit before. It it really is this human chess game, right? Yeah. And there's this physical element to it that is just it, it's always a good like I always say like people either work out for either go for competition reasons or they go for like the headiness of it, mm-hmm. but everyone goes for a good workout. Like yeah, no matter yeah. what your, whatever your, your skill set, you always get a good workout out of jujitsu. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, wow. That's crazy, man. Cause our, I, we're pretty similar. I mean, I, I did, I did CrossFit for years, was heavy into CrossFit. Um, yeah. The jujitsu, you know, I, Oh, you know, I was a wrestler in high school always in my life. I kind of like told myself that like, I would want to like learn some kind of like self-defense or martial art, you know, and I kind of, you know, my, my brother-in-law kind of, got into it and you know he's he's very good at jujitsu and you know what i in addition to you know as you say like the um the human chess game element of it and uh just how mental it is and you know how physical it's also the fact that you know it's the only combat sport where you can go as falls to the wall as hard as you can and the risk of injury or trauma is you know relatively low listen there's a lot of you know there's a lot of injuries in jujitsu guess what there's a lot of injuries in uh pickup basketball too and any kind of like contact sport so you know i there's no um there's no striking so you know there's no head trauma i can't afford to experience any heart trauma i don't have any skills other than doctoring um if i if i can't doctor anymore i'm I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to have to get my CrossFit level one. <laughs> I don't know. You know, so yeah. So I can't do any striking, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I love it. I love that you can, you know, you go hard and, you know, you do your best and, you know, at the end of it, you know, there, there does tend to be a lot of um, good sportsmanship in jujitsu, you know? Yeah. And, and my, so my dad, he's done Japanese jujitsu and he's done it for 40 years. He's, you reached the pinnacle of that. Um, and, a couple of his, I, I know a couple of his students pretty well. And one of them came in and I, and I was talking to him. I was like, oh, I think I'm going to sign up for, uh, for Japanese jiu-jitsu. He's like, nah. <laughs> and he's a black belt in both. He's like, do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I was like, I was like, no, no, no. He's like, no, no, no. Huh. Go do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Why? So, so he was just, he was like, it's just the most addicting. He's like, you're going to just be addicted to it. And I went to uh, Igor's one day. I watched the class. I met with Juan. I was like, you know, I, I think about signing up. And he was like, all right, cool. He's like, come down. You know, he's just so casual about things. Like, come down, you know, we'll do a little training, whatever. <laughs> I wore like shorts and a t-shirt. I was like, and I was like doing CrossFit. And I was like, all right, I'm in CrossFit yeah, shape. Yeah. Like, I can hold my own. Here's Juan. Oh, I was like, for reference point, Juan's like five, nine, five, eight, somewhere in that world. He's put on weight since a couple of years. Okay. Ago. But let's say at that time he was one. Yeah. Like 55, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I was probably like yeah. 180, but yeah. like, in good shape. I was like, all right, well, this I'm going to toss this guy around. That's and, nice. and he literally just the way he distributed his weight on my body that I was just like, I can't do anything right now. I'm, I'm helpless. And that feeling of helplessness was horrifying. Mm. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't, I can't do any, like I literally could do nothing. And then it was also like super motivating. And I was like, I need to learn this. And then that was it. And then I remember warming up in the gi. And I was like, I'm tired. Like I was just running around the mat. I was like, yeah. I'm not in this shape. I'm in CrossFit shape. Right. Like I could, I could hold myself down in a wad, but this is different. Like I'm not in this shape. I need to figure this thing it out. It is different. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, cra- it's so crazy what a black belt can do. It's like, you know, it, 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 there's basic physical forces involved, <laughs> right? Like, like, you know, I'm, you know, Listen, I'm pretty strong. I'm not as strong as some, you know, 180 pounds. You know, I squat 300 pounds. I don't think this guy could do that or, you know, or, or bench press this. I should be able to. No, you, you can't believe me. You can't. It's, it, you know, they, they, they just they just know how to move, you know? Yeah, there's there's a body awareness. And I, I was speaking to uh, Mike. He's a brown belt at the academy. And uh, and he, he really nailed it. And he's like, there's a connection that you feel with your partner. Right. And. If you really, and that's where like the headiness comes in for me. If you really like, you ever try rolling with like your eyes closed? <laughs> no. Never tried that? I will get choked. No, so you fast. won't. You won't. Because there's like this, there's this, hmm. like this, this energy that you can almost, here we go. Uh, there's this energy that you can almost like tap into, hmm. right? That's, there's a flow hmm. to it, right? Hmm. And when you get a good partner and you can connect with someone and like, it sounds weird, but like there's this connection level like, you could feel the flow. It's like when you get a good rolling partner and you could feel the flow of the, of, of the way it's going. And 
you know, you're you're putting each other in good positions. I actually don't think you're being crazy. I actually, I, this this kind of this, makes sense. This is yeah, the like, dementia well, setting on. No, no, no. It kind of <laughs> makes sense. Like, uh, yeah, like you could you could well you could feel like weight distribution and like and get a sense of what someone's going to do next. And, yes, and actually, you know. So yes, and then and then for me, a big part of like my own internal wins in jujitsu is if I'm rolling with a higher belt brown, like you know, brown purple, some some degree, but really brown or black belt. If I feel the setup and and even if i like tap on the next move if i just feel the setup of like you're happy oh man yeah, yeah. i felt that and I'll, I'll i'll ask i'll be like hey bobby like or you know Joao, like wh whomever orlando i'm like uh were you doing this so that i would do this to put me in this position mm -hmm. and like yeah i'm like wow. yes like <laughs> yes and then like obviously the the black belts are yeah. countless steps ahead they're just putting you in position after position yeah this is how I know you're more advanced in your jujitsu journey than I. <laughs> no, not at all. No, no. I suck at it. Yeah, I yeah. suck at it yeah. so much. Yeah, but yeah. like, again, the headiness for me is yeah. where I really, I just love it. I just love like, and the funny thing is I was, I was telling somebody, I like jujitsu off the mat way more than I like it on the mat because on the mat, my vulnerabilities, my abilities, they all suck. Like I mm. suck on the mat. Like, mm. and, and I, I'm a blue belt, right? right. So I, I suck as a blue belt and what that means. Right. But off the mat, it's not that I think I'm better, but I feel I just there's so much more. You can take there. a step back and, and and view it with perspective, which is yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like the, the the mat really is like the proving ground. And I'm like, oh, all right. The anxiety that uh, comes with that. Yeah. Right, right. It's like, all right, I kind of see where I am on the pecking order of this shit. <laughs> but when I'm not on it, I'm just all stoked about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yep. So all right. Well, glad we talked about that. I mean, is that that's that's another <laughs> pillar of uh of dementia prevention uh regular exercise you know? is it really oh absolutely absolutely and longevity and just dude, yeah i mean honestly like you know I, I i'm sure i'm preaching to the choir on this but you know movement is medicine right like yeah. you know just if you don't if you don't use it you lose it 100 percent. you know especially as you you and i were we're staring down the barrel of uh middle age here sure and uh you know, it's going to be important for us to to continue doing this sort of thing, like you know, the weightlifting, the conditioning, and and also challenging yourself mentally with things like like jujitsu. You know, how much does does the does the dementia kind of stay rooted, but through physical activity? Have they done like any type of studies? Like, hey, this person is experiencing early stages of dementia. Mm -hmm. We get their body moving. We get mm -hmm. some things going. We mm -hmm. clean up their diet. We start mm -hmm. doing all of these things. Is there any uh turn around to the dementia or is there any like stagnant point from the dementia mm -hmm. from changing mm -hmm. lifestyle i think i think at that point it that specific study has not been done but you know i think that at that point you're 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 already late it, it's about it's about cle keeping your your arteries clean in, in middle age really you know like like 40 to 60 you know like um keeping that healthy lifestyle uh but there are studies like in older people with a lot of people with like mild cognitive impairment um, that, you know, physical training, you know, they, there was a randomized clinical trial of Tai Chi for the elderly. And they it found that like it, it reduced falls and, you know, fall, like who cares? Well, falls are frequently fatal in the elderly, you know, particularly if they result in, you know, a hip fracture or something like that. So, you know, yeah. So yeah, even if you're starting late, you know, movement is medicine. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. Tai Chi ever do like Tai Chi or Qigong or anything of that nature? No. I've done I've done like an like a like an online Qigong class and it's very it's um again I'm a very woo woo kind of guy so <laughs> I I own that I own it wholeheartedly uh but there is something to it it's it's like this uh heightened energetic yoga mm -hmm. right it's not as movement like it's very movement based but it's not as uh pose based I guess you could say okay but there is like a like a flow to it sure. uh and you definitely like when you're like moving with it and you're kind of getting into it like you definitely feel like the energy around you kind of moving you know mm -hmm. same way as like like you said earlier like you know there is an energy to the movement in jujitsu right like you can close your all right you know you can close your eyes and you can kind of feel the flow of the mat a little bit right right yeah i absolutely agree i mean yeah i mean and you know putting it in like scientific or medical terms, you know, you're, you're improving your proprioception, which is a sense of like body awareness and, uh, and balance. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, kind of like dancing, but you know, very yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to go back to the, to the, to the, uh, the article you wrote, okay. the odd thing about, well, not the odd thing, but Medicare, 
yeah uh which is kind of a big part of this kind of yeah. this drug itself is it a drug can we call it a drug we can call it a drug okay all right so uh a big part of this drug is that medicare is not covering it yeah in some in yeah so uh yeah so most cases almost all cases it's very interesting because um the fda so it's very interesting so in in our you know in our country the fda is the is the organization that you know the government mental organization that oversees like drug development and approval right and so the the company biogen you know it works with the fda it puts all this data together and it submits an application to the fda and the fda approved as you for the treatment of dementia it said there's enough here and you know you you are approved and and basically on that news like biogen stock you know went up 60 percent or whatever so sure. you know created some overnight millionaires when the fda approves a drug in almost all cases medic so you know it's one thing to approve a drug right but somebody has to pay for it right okay? and you know at the time this drug was the the list price was fifty six thousand dollars per year okay. wow yeah fifty six thousand dollars per year so uh it was approved and by the fda and in most cases when the fda approves a drug it's it's kind of like a rubber stamping by medicare who is the largest uh health insurer in the united states is the largest like payer basically uh, covers many, many people. And obviously, as you might imagine, Medicare being an insurance for the elderly, there's many, many people with dementia who have Medicare. Right. Right. So uh, Medicare is the largest insurer. So Medicare now has to make the decision. Um, are you, is it going to cover this, this very expensive medication? And as I said, you know, generally uh, when a drug is approved by the FDA, Medicare usually rubber stamps it. It's like, this is, this is good to go. Let's go. Right. Okay. But um, in this particular case, you know, you know, they looked at the data. They said, listen, you have one study that shows that it works. The other study uh, does not show a benefit. And we're not going to pay for this for, you know, for, for all of these people. And the only time that we are going to cover it is if um, the person's enrolled in a randomized clinical trial, basically so that a third trial can be done to definitively prove whether or not this, this medication works. Is it usually done that way? Is that something that's kind of like standard protocol for them? I mean, it, from their standpoint, it kind of makes sense mm -hmm. um, because, you know, 50-50 here right now. Right. But the fact that the FDA went ahead and gave it this, the, the stamp of approval mm -hmm. shows that there is something there. Yes. So is this something that they've done before that they could kind of justify not covering it? Or mm -hmm. is this something that's kind of a one-off? Right. Um, it's, 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 it's a one-off really, but it's, it's a really unique situation. Um, even like when, when the medication was, uh, was approved by the FDA, like it, it generated a, a large response from, from like a panel that, you know, of scientists that was asked to review it. Like the FDA basically asked a, a panel of neuroscientists to review this data and see if they recommend it for approval. And they did not recommend it for approval. And, uh, you know, FDA went ahead and, and approved it anyway. And those people resigned essentially. Wow. So why months. didn't they approve it for, why didn't the neuroscientists approve it? This is where it gets a little technical, but um, the neuroscientists were viewing it on the, on the, they were looking at the benefit data, really. They were looking at this one trial shows the, um, that there, that there's a 40% decline in the progression of dementia. The other study does not show a benefit. Jury's still out. We shouldn't approve this medication, but the FDA was going off of, there's something called Let's get, get in the weeds for a minute. Yeah, let's go. Let's they, go. Have, they have the accelerated approval pathway, okay? And basically- so Is this like when you go to Disney and you have the, the speed pass? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's, it's like, Peter Pan, 10 minutes, let's what, roll. What it comes, yes, yes, exactly. It's very fast. And what it comes from is like the early 90s, basically, and the, the abysmal response of, of this country to, to the epidemic of HIV. And like, you know, people were dying by the thousands and they just did not create any medications to- uh, to treat these poor people, you know, and so in response, there was there was uh, legislation that enabled uh, medications to be approved faster. And the way they same thing with vaccines. Yeah, same thing. The way they could be approved faster is if they, they don't have to show a clinical benefit, they don't have to show that that they actually like reduce heart attacks or reduce the dementia or anything like that. All they have to do is show an, an intermediate effect that is reasonably likely to um, to, to have the, the impact on the thing downstream. So in this particular case, the FDA said, Aduhelm definitively reduces the amyloid in the brain, okay? We know it does, it reduces it a lot, okay? And we reasonably expect that that's going to, you know, re reduce the progression of dementia, 
And based on that, you know, we're going to approve the drug on this accelerated approval pathway. So accelerated approval pathway, good thing. I mean, it, you know, it, it helps, you know, get life saving, saving medications out faster for, for people in this particular case, perhaps it has a lot of medication out that, that may or may not work. We don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. That is a really tough one because again, there's so many people and, and the amount of people that you had said that are going to be experiencing this down the pipeline is, is the numbers like staggering. Like it's very sad. It's, it's, it's scary. And it's something that affects our culture beyond right and it, it's kind of to your point earlier it's like it's not just this this disease i guess for lack of a better term that's affecting but it's it's really the deterioration of of a person right yes. and watching that happen so if there's any way if there's any sign that this can kind of at least slow down that progression and give people a little bit more quality of life and a little bit more dignity mm -hmm. you would think that the majority of people from a humanistic standpoint would be on board for that no right. matter what i mean again we talked about the placebo effect earlier right. like that's a real thing so even right. if you know there was this i mean i don't know how well placebo would work in in this particular case um probably not much right but even if there was something that was you know slowing down the progression yeah. of this you would think that most people would be like all right just do it well you know? that's how patients and families feel and i mean and they were outraged at medicare's decision and you know it's controversial on both sides absolutely you know yeah, I mean, I, 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 I definitely see their point. I tend to, I tend to side with Medicare because it's a, it's an enormous expense that's going to like the pharmaceutical companies, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, that they're getting a medication that works. And there's one other thing that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet, which is that, you know, it, it does have like, um, it has side effects as well. Okay, and like, so forty percent of people experience, they experience cerebral swelling or brain hemorrhage. Okay. And it's, wow. it's yes, but it is very mild. And the, the majority of these people are like asymptomatic, although one person in the study did die. So now is that based on how uh, severe the Alzheimer's is? Or is that just ah, very, very insightful question? Actually, it does. Be well, uh, because it, it depends on people who have a large amyloid burden, if there's a lot of amyloid in there that that this drug is targeting and it's removing it all, it generates a large response and can generate like swelling and bleeding. Yeah, that makes sense that if you need a larger amount to, you know, depending on how much they have, yeah. you know, it would, it would have to attack more. Right, so not only is there the, you know, the, the financial question, but there's also the, you know, there's side effects. It's not a totally benign medication. I don't want to oversell the, the you know, the, the side effect part of it. Again, the majority of these are like asymptomatic. Sure. Um, but, you know, it is a consideration. Is 40% kind of a considerable amount when it comes to these types of uh, uh, results? It's, I mean, it's a huge number. Uh, and But for the majority of them don't require any treatment really and just need to be observed, you know? Yeah. But, you know, it's a concerning finding on an MRI and one person did die. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. You know, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, we live in a... Um, for a prop, we live in a capitalistic for profit, you know, uh, medicine and healthcare world. And it's, it's very interesting, because like it has it has clear benefits, and it has clear drawbacks, because, you know, in the United States, um, you know, we have these, these for profit pharmaceutical companies, we are at the absolute forefront of, of biomedical innovation, we, we benefit from, you know, from uh, cutting edge technologies that are treating diseases and saving lives. But you know, we also pay for it. We, we, we pay a lot. We pay, we pay more than, you know, other countries do for healthcare. Yeah. And then, but then when you see it from, again, that ground level, I remember going into the doctor's office with my daughter to get something. It was a shot or some, something, right? I also don't remember what it is. I'm not avoiding what it was. I just genuinely don't remember, but I remember them coming out with the, the tray. Right. Yeah. And it was just like advertisement, 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 drug company, drug company, drug company, drug company. I was like, can we get like just a regular tray? Does it need to have 50 different drug companies on it? Like, do we need to have all of these drug companies? And I get it. I, I, I do understand there, there is, it is a business at the end of the day. There's no question about that. But I think when it comes down to the quality of life and the humanistic dignity and whether you want to call it a soul, whatever it is, when it comes down to the, the, the bare rights as a human being, mm -hmm. there, there's, there, again, it's not going to happen but there is a line in the sand that we have to say, this is just better for the greater good. And, and profit aside or cost aside, uh, this is something that we need to, to implement and roll out for you know, the amount of people that are going to experience this over the next X amount of years. You know, 
there is a, obviously a benefit to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there, there does come a point where it's like, is this, is this better for the greater good? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm not a doctor or scientist, you know, no, but I'm no, just, no. you know, but I'm just saying like, and I understand the other perspective where it's like, yeah, okay, great. But you know, at the same time, you know, I get that, but I think that, you know, there is, there is a humanistic aspect that we've, we've moved and become so far removed from in so many avenues of life. And one thing I, I definitely culturally we've been removed from is our elders, right? We, we put them in nursing homes and we, you know, we put them on the other side of the room or we put them in the basement, like, Oh, don't worry about grandma. And that's, and that's something that I think as, as a culture specifically, you know, when you look at uh, uh, native American tribes, you look at, you know, um, certain cultures, the, you know, uh, Asian cultures, the, the, the care and the reverence they have towards their right. elders right. is, is beyond right. almost to an extreme, but in our culture, it's like, ah, eh, throw them in a nursing home. See you later. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I mean, if we, you know, I, dropping truth bombs here between me and you, like, I mean, if, who do you want to blame for that? Perhaps we should look in the mirror because what you get is what you're willing to pay for as a society. You know, sure. it's, it's you, me, and like our neighbors and like, you know, what, what taxes are you willing to pay for, for like, you know, and it's, it's for, you know, for all that. And I, of course I agree that like, we have to treat like the elderly with like, with dignity and, and you know what, it's, it's expensive to do that sometimes because they sure. need assistance with like many of their activities of daily living and sure. all this sort of stuff. And so, you know, basically you get what you pay for. And, you know, we just aren't putting the bill for this, you know, for this, for the kind of care that we would, we would want for these individuals. And that makes me, that, that goes to the, the core of like this, like tension of like, of like healthcare in a capitalist society, because like, you know, there's a lot of time and energy spent, you know, in, in my profession, like thinking about like, you know, how can we make things safer? Like, you know, like how can we miss less sepsis? How can we, how can we improve outcomes? You know, and we spend, we, we do these studies and we like, and we, 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 we set up these initiatives and we try, and you know what? Sometimes the answer is we just need to hire more fucking nurses. You know what yeah. I mean? Like we yeah. just need to hire, we just need, you know what the problem with that is it costs money to hire nurses. You know what I mean? Like, right. so, I mean, that's, that's the tension. You know, if we had more nurses, people would get their medications faster. They wouldn't have to be as rushed. They'd be able to like, you know, to be more observant and, and not miss things, that sort of thing, you know? Do you think, I mean, clearly there is, a, you know, just based off of that comment, there is, there is a, a, a drought, for lack of a better word, in, in the healthcare field. Why, why do you think that is? Are people just not drawn to the field? Is there not enough, uh, you know, risk and reward? Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, the drought is primarily in, in nursing, you know, that that's where the, the biggest shortage is. And uh, I think, I think there's a lot of burnout, man. It's been like, it's been two years of like pandemic nurses. Especially now, yeah. Yeah. Nurses were asked to, to just shoulder like a lot, you know, just sh shoulder an incredible burden. And, you know, they, dude, you wouldn't believe how hard their jobs are. You know, they like, they're in there, they're rolling patients that weigh 300 pounds. They're changing them. They're changing diapers. They're administering medications, but don't fuck it up because maybe you're going to go to jail, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of pressure. It's a very bottom line. It's a very hard job. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, their compensation is only fair. You right. know what I mean? Right. And so I think that, you know, I think that they're, they're leaving to a certain extent. Yeah. And I think that that, that stems into the education world too. Right. I think that's the same thing for teachers, like the amount and that's me. I'll be fully biased. My wife's a teacher. I come from a family of teachers, mm. uh, but I see the amount of work effort, energy that mm -hmm. goes into that the adaptability factor that they have to kind of online like especially in, like you said the last few years online not online in class not in class yeah. I, you know um and then obviously that stems into like the special ed world and like children that have certain needs and it's 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 a micro again a microcosm of the the macro problem and the, again that's the the again kind of goes back to our previous point of it's the same story right and the same feelings involved which is different humanistic experiences so like you have the nurses that are you know on the forefront of all of this dealing with all of this we want to say underpaid whatever you want to say but they're under appreciated in yeah. value right yeah. uh and you could say same thing for like teachers right it's mm -hmm. the same thing they're just 
underappreciated, undervalued. It's like, oh, well, they get summers off. Fuck them. And it's like, summer yeah. turns out to be like, seven yeah. Weeks. yeah, it's really not like, I remember, like, remember when you were a kid, like, I feel like summer vacation was forever. And yeah. like, as an adult, I look at like, what are you off, like two weeks? Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. that great anymore. Yeah. You know, it's summer's just, you know, when you're an adult, it's just, you're, it's just hot. Like, that's yeah. it. There's no more like, you know, yeah, childlike yeah. wonder to the summer. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. There's no question. My brother in law is a teacher too. And, I couldn't agree more <laughs> with yeah. everything you're saying. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just again, I, and I think that there's that's a cultural problem, right? Yeah. And they, and it and it's it seeps its way into all aspects of life, you know, and and people take that personally and they own that, and again, that becomes part of their identity and the frustration that comes with that, and yeah. you know, and that and then you know, not to make light of it, then people are jumping into tiger cages because they they they're they feel so unseen and heard and felt, and you know, they're at a point of despair, you know. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah, kind of a bummer. I mean, think about it. Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really, it's like, you know, and it's, I mean, it, it's really, it's really kind of dark because, I mean, if you're thinking about it, it's like teachers and nurses, who are they serving? They're serving the children, the sick, and the elderly. And it's like, it's are, there, not, are there more important people in our community than right, to be serving those? So, how, how much, how much value are we putting on those groups? It, it's clear that it's, not what it should be well we put we put all the value in in the guy or the or the or the gal who are killing themselves at work right oh work culture go here do this work these hours kill yourself slave yourself yeah. you know and, and that's where finance we put, bro finds a way to you know yeah get an extra 0.1 percent on some loan or something like right that. exactly and 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 that's what we put our value in is that's that your interview tomorrow some finance bro yeah tomorrow i'm having finance bro one on the oh, podcast how many podcasts have you done uh Four hundred and fifty. Oh, there has to be some finance bro out there, dude. Uh, but you know what? It's funny because it's it's it hasn't always been this, right? So I I mean I have four hundred and fifty one episodes out there, uh, but it was a very different show. It was it was you know very uh, rooted in like Opie and Anthony style yeah. kind of shock jock. It was me and two other guys, hmm. and then with my own growth and evolution of time. Uh, it became a lot more reflective and cerebral mm -hmm. just as I started to grow, mm -hmm. and then. I, I love conversation like that. Yeah. Talk about flow state. Talk about like jujitsu flow state. There's nothing yeah. that gets me more flowing than than the nuance of conversation. Yeah, yeah, cool, man. So that's yeah. uh, that's cool. That's cool. It, yeah, it, it's awesome. Like I was going, like we circling back to the beginning. We were talking about like pursuing new perspectives and challenging yourself. I think is very important. You know. Yeah, I, it absolutely is. Um, where can people? I mean, read your article. I mean, if there's anything that you'd want to mm -hmm. tell people, what would it, what would it absolutely be? Sure. I mean, just, I mean, it's as crazy as it is. Like, I mean, in terms of medicine, it's just, it's taking care of yourself with like the, like the basic steps. Like that's what I really recommend, you know, eat healthy, um, exercise, move daily, you know, get your sleep. Okay. That's a neglected piece of this that ever, that, uh, that everyone has. And, you know, um, and, seek meaning in your life. I think that's another thing. I mean, we've been kind of dancing around this idea of meaning um, throughout this conversation, but I think that that is another key to, um, to brain health and to longevity is, is having a reason to get out of bed in the morning and, you know, having a reason to exist. I mean, I don't know, you know, if you think of it's, it's sad, but you know, it's, 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 it's kind of the reason you think about like, um, you know, why when, you know, an old elderly couple, like, you know, like the wife dies, like very frequently, like the husband dies, like just a couple months later, like, when you lose that, that, uh, meaning or community in your life, um, you know, you lose a lot, you lose a major piece. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think, uh, that humanistic connection that we have, uh, whether it be tangible or, you know, subatomical, so, you know, quantum, if you will, there, there's something to that, you know, and I, and I think, you know, all of it, it works in, 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 in a circle, right? Like you find meeting, you, you know, you're more fueled to get out of bed than you're, you, you know, you'll move your body more. You'll start to eat right. Like it's like jujitsu, right? Like you want to eat right because you want to like fuel your body correctly. And then you want to fuel your body correctly. Like, you know, it's the old, like, you know, snaking its own tail kind of thing. And then it just, I think meaning's a really great point. You know, I think that that's a lot where people, I'd be interested to see what careers people with Alzheimer's had throughout their lives. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, that'd be a very in-depth study, but no, I, like, yeah. I'd be very curious to see like, you know, that meaning piece. And, you know, is there something that once things start to shift the identity, how much of that is, is still holding on to that meaning? I think, and I think people who are disconnected from, from the community, whether it's work or not, 
you know, because like a lot of people don't work, but they, they have very meaningful community. They go to church, or they have groups and stuff like that, or, or, you know, sports even, whatever. Uh, yeah. So, I, yeah. So work can be, you know, the source, but perhaps not. I think if you, if you're trying to look for jobs that cause dementia, it's like, it's like my job. It's like, <laughs> it's, like, it's, like it's jobs, it's jobs where you work at night. That's a thing. Cause it like disrupts your circadian rhythm and uh, you can't quite recover the same way, you know? Yeah, they, they sleep is not something you could like, oh, I'll bank the next four hours. Like once you lose sleep, there's no regaining it. They yeah. can't just like gather. You can't just sleep more hours to make up for the loss. Yeah, man. Yeah. Interesting stuff, man. Thank you so much. Dude, I really appreciate you coming gonna, on. This is to, fantastic. Have to come on again so we could talk some uh, Star Wars and some trail running. Right, we, <laughs> we didn't. We're gonna, yeah, we, you're, I know you're into trail running, too. You do it all. I, I started uh, probably like a year ago, and I haven't been uh diligent with it by any stretch of the imagination but again one of those things that i was like i want to kind of run a trail and then i did it and i was like oh rabbit hole like yeah, it is yeah. you know I, I i'm drawn to the to the rabbit holes like jujitsu and chess and you know trail running and sensory deprivation i guess you know the meaning of life you know yeah, it yeah, kind yeah. of all it all kind of uh works in conjunction with each other yeah yeah it's, but, it's awesome dude thank you so much for coming on this was tremendous was awesome. um i appreciate you coming on and uh sharing your wisdom and your knowledge brother dope dude this was great appreciate it awesome